everybody, my name is Leonard Neuhaus. I'm one of the co-creators of Purple, which is a, a software for the right Pitaya, which uh, you can see here. Uh, and today I'm going to explain you uh, a bunch of stuff that you can do with Purple. For example, uh, with this example Michelson interferometer, which I have here, I'll show you how to uh, sweep the interferometer, uh, interferometer arm length difference. I'm going to show you how to monitor the uh, interference fringes with an oscilloscope. Uh, next, we're going to try to lock the interferometer, and finally, we'll try to check uh, the transfer function of this uh, actuator we have here, using the network analyzer. To explain you the theory of this, uh, let's go to the blackboard. So, the theory is not uh, that complicated. We start with the laser, uh, that emits uh, some laser light towards the beam splitter, uh, which is split into two partial uh, beams. One hitting mirror one, uh, the green one, and the red one hitting mirror two. And then after the reflection, uh, each of those uh, partial beams will hit the beam splitter again, and part of each beam will get transmitted towards the photodetector. So you have one part of the green beam going to the photodetector, and another uh, part of the light to the photodetector from the red beam. And you can already see here, if both path lengths are equal, uh, we have both of these waves arriving exactly in phase, so you get constructive interference, meaning the hill or the maximum of the field from mirror one and the maximum of the field from mirror two will add up, and you will get a lot of light hitting the photodetector. However, whenever I move this mirror two, I will change the relative path lengths, so the uh, relative phase of those two beams will get modified so that meaning a maximum of the field from mirror 1 will hit a minimum of uh, mirror 2, and thus those two lights will actually cancel out, and you get no light at the photodetector. And this is how you can measure small displacements uh, at this uh, scale of the wavelength with the Microsoft interferometer. So here you can see the actual interferometer. We start with the laser. Uh, you, you can see the beam coming from this uh, simple laser diode going towards the beam splitter. Beam splitter splits it in one beam going towards this mirror and another beam going towards this mirror, as you can see here, which uh, both are silver mirrors which just reflect the beam back onto itself, so back to the uh, beam splitter, with the exception that the second mirror, which is uh, the movable one, is, uh, has actually a small magnet behind it, which is uh, close to a coil, so it's just like a loudspeaker and by uh, uh, sending a current through this coil, we can make it move forth and back. So this is what this cable is for. So the, the two reflections from the two mirrors will recombine at the beam splitter. Part will go back to the laser. The other part will go uh, towards the photodetector here. So uh, as you can see here, uh, if I block either of the beams, you can see that there's still some light from the uh, other path is still left. And if I slightly touch this mirror, you can see that uh, uh, the interference pattern will change, uh, as I explained, because you're going from constructive to destructive interference and back. Okay, so uh, now we can get started uh, with connecting a red tire. So here is one uh, still in the box, so it's just like you would receive it. If I unpack it, uh, there's a bunch of documentation stuff and the actual device. So uh, just take it out. I've already prepared the SD card, uh, with uh, which you can download, uh, the content of which you can download at the link below. So I just insert it, and with this, uh, the software part is ready. And uh, next, I will connect the different cables. So uh, we've we've said we want to uh, detect the signal from the photodetector. Uh, I connect the PNC cable to the output of the photodiode. I connect it to input 1, you can see it's input 1, input 2, output 1, output uh, 2. So I just connect it to the analog input 1. Uh, for this I have some adapters here, but it's really just a bare connection. If you work at high frequencies, it's always good to put a 50 ohm uh, terminator, but uh, since this is very low frequency, it's uh, okay like this. Now we connect output 1 uh, to the coil here, so we can drive the mirror into motion. So just connect the SMA of this cable to output 1. Uh, 
and that's all for the analog connections. Next thing we need to connect the Ethernet so we can access from a PC. And the last thing uh, to do is connect the power supply. So, and the power supply here. And now you can see the lights are flashing, the repeater is powered up, and uh, we can get started by uh, launching the purple software on the PC. So uh, here we have the computer, and I've already uh, downloaded the. Uh, the Windows executable for purple, uh, and that's all I have to launch. So just double click on it. Of course, uh, you have to confirm that you want to execute it, and then you can see it starting. Actually, this Windows executable uh, is, has a whole Python installation inside of it, that's why it takes a while to start. If you uh, run it directly from Python, it's a little bit quicker. Okay. So, uh, first thing it asks you is uh, to create a configuration file, so it can save whatever you've uh, configured for later use. So basically, you can, if you pick a config file, you can later on close uh, purple and restart it by selecting the same configuration file uh, and find find yourself in the same configuration you were before. So your work is not lost in this way. So I just type away. Uh, I, I call it uh, demo. Let's save it under this name. And the next thing is, uh, if you've never, uh, if you're using it for the first time, it will try to locate uh, the right area on the network. Okay, and if it uh, if it's unable to connect, uh, it will complain. But here it's uh, it's been working, and I put it to full screen. The next thing I have to do is uh, start some kind of module. So I start by opening the oscilloscope. So you just click on modules here in the corner and select the scopes, which will open the scope interface. And if I click on Run Continuous, you will see that the data is running on the screen, uh, coming from the two inputs, input one and input two, in this case. I can select different signals, and for now I just, I'm just interested in, in input 1 because that's where we connected the uh, photodiode output, and you can see that the screen is showing that signal, uh, well, something's actually happening here, and this is because I'm sitting on the same table as the interferometer and I'm actually shaking it, so if I, I just hit the table, you can see that uh, I perturb the interferometer, and you can see that uh, interference fringes are shown here. I do this more carefully now, just touching one of the mirrors, you can see the signal is always oscillating between uh, the maximum and the minimum value which correspond to constructive and destructive interference and everything in between is uh, some intermediate region. Uh, next thing I want to try is uh, whether I connected uh, properly the, the output of the red pitaya to the driver. So I'll open an arbitrary signal generator by clicking on ASGs, which is here, to select it here. Actually I can drop its uh, interface to, to be shown together at the same time with the scope, like this. And uh, you can see you have two arbitrary signal generators. I'm just going to use one for now, so I can actually uh, share the space like this. And let's just start by outputting uh, a voltage ramp of one volt amplitude, an off uh, no offset, at a frequency that's, uh, let's start with one hertz. Let's put a one here. And uh, to, to make it start, I put the trigger source to immediately, so I can start outputting. And the output I want is output 1, because that's how I uh, were connected everything. And you can see as soon as I, se I selected output, you can see that there's uh, something happening with the interferometer. Let me show you what is happening on output 1 uh, in red. And you can see here in red, while, uh, while the voltage is uh, swinging up and down, you can see that this causes the interferometer fringes to uh, uh, to change from constructive to destructive interference. Now we can just uh, try to visualize the signal a little bit better. For example, increase the, the sweep frequency a little bit. Then we can change the trigger source of the scope by clicking on normal mode, that is uh, triggered mode, and trigger it on the arbitrary signal generator directly. And I can actually change the time scale by changing the value of duration, the arrows. And here now you can see nicely, uh, nicely that that uh, the light intensity does sinusoidal uh, oscillations as you change uh, the displacement or the voltage or the displacement of one mirror. And you can also see if I clap in my hands now, or if I if I talk loudly, 
that you can actually see my voice perturbing the diaphragmator. So we can just clap. And now I start uh, configuring the lockbox to actually stabilize the interferometer. So I select the lockbox uh, module and it opens here. So if I show, uh, I've actually pre configured it uh, to make this a little bit faster. But uh, the important thing is first to select the class name, which is uh, one of the different types of cavities that we've pre configured. But it's actually uh, not so difficult to create your own if you have more special needs. But in this case, it's just an interferometer meaning you have one default output, which, uh, which, is, which we call piezo, because most of the time it's a piezo, in this case it's a loudspeaker, but uh, uh, anyways, this is just the name of the output. And uh, the next important parameter is the wavelength, entered here. I put uh, 650 nanometers because it's uh, somewhat a red uh, laser. And uh, then you have here, you configure the locking sequence, which basically is a sequence, I can add uh, any number of stages here. And, um, but actually for a normal interferometer, I just need a single stage where you specify the input, that is the signal that you use to stabilize the set point, which is zero degrees, meaning you lock in the middle between constructive and destructive interference. Duration, uh, which is just the time to sleep, gain factor, and the outputs that you want to lock on. In this case, we want to use the piezo, and before locking, we want to set it uh, to zero volts, so it starts in the middle uh, of its range. Let me hide the sequence. Uh, talking about the various uh, inputs and outputs, here we have the piezo configuration where we have to enter first which output channel it's connected to, then uh, the analog DC gain where I put uh, here I put 100 uh, nanometers per volt. This is because uh, when I do a full sweep on the scope, let me let me show you the full sweep and pause the scope. And as you, as you can see, I'm going from the output goes from plus one to minus one, so over two volts. And as it does so, you do uh, one and roughly one half full periods of, uh, of oscillations of the interference ranges, meaning uh, you cover a, a distance of roughly, uh, I don't know, uh, two, three hundred nanometers. So this is why uh, I put 100 nanometers per volt in this uh, box. And then uh, here you've already seen that I swept. So I put the sweep frequency, sweep amplitude and sweep waveform which will be used when I click on the sweep button here. The one word about uh, the inputs, which is uh, just one interferometer port that we need, where we configure the input signal to input one, and we actually have to click the calibrate button to get the right uh, numbers here. And after doing so, I, I'm finally ready uh, to try to lock the interferometer. So let me just click, uh, show you the sequence here, and click the lock button, you can see we go to this, uh, the last stage, go through all the stages actually, and as you can see on the scope, if I make it running, uh, something is happening here, but it looks actually like it's, uh, it's uh, oscillating because the gain is too high. So let me put the scope here, and uh, so I can simultaneously uh, change the logbox gain and uh, watch the signal on the scope. And let me decrease the unity gain frequency of the piezo and as I play with this value, you can see that the oscillation changes until I decrease it further. And now it's actually not oscillating anymore. And uh, I've reached uh, reasonable lock parameters. So uh, to demonstrate this, let me show you the difference between uh, a locked and a non-locked uh, uh, state. So here you see, actually right now it's locked. So let me unlock it or sweep it, you can see the green signal uh, and uh, it's actually doing full scale oscillations. I unlock it, it's somewhat stable, but uh, it's very easy to perturb. And uh, you can see over time it drifts. And now I lock, and it's actually held stable in the middle. So you can see when I speak, I actually perturb it so I can use it as a microphone. But apart from this, it's uh, actually very stable. Let me show you the output. And this is because the output signal is fed back. Uh, uh, feeds the, the measured displacement so that it actually always keeps the arm uh, length difference uh, constant. And the next thing we want to do is measure the transfer function of the actuator. Uh, for this to do, uh, we have to start the network analyzer module, which opens up down here. If I put it uh, higher and um, on the more central part of the screen for better visibility, 
you can see uh, various uh, controls. So first we have to set the input uh, to input 1, the interferometer uh, output, the output to output 1 to the speaker. Start frequency I will put to 200 Hz and the stop frequency to about uh, 10 kHz. And the resolution bandwidth, which is the inverse uh, time per point, I will put to 150 Hz. And last, uh, the amplitude I have to reduce a little bit because I've tried earlier and I had some saturation problems. So here it's set to 10 millivolts. And I will just do one average. Uh, and here we go. You can see uh, already from the phase response, which is uh, almost constant at uh, plus or minus 180 degrees, that there is a coherent response, which is a good sign, which means we are not uh, measuring just noise. And in the amplitude uh, response up here, you can see that actually there seems to be something like a resonance around 600 kilohertz. This is probably the reasons why we had uh, problems with the uh, uh, too much gain when we set the lockbox parameters and then you just keep on uh, measuring the rest of the response. Actually at this resonance uh, it looks like uh, at 600 Hz looks like there is uh, also some saturation effect because uh, the shape is somewhat atypical, but in the phase response on the resonance, you see the typical uh, pi over two phase shift uh, at the resonance. So, roughly speaking, this seems like a good measurement. And now it just takes a lot of time to acquire the remaining points, and I think uh, we leave it here. And uh, that's it. The interferometer is locked. So, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>